Um, well, you know, we were talking before uh, the show started that PNG has been doing this sustainability way before one, the world was invented, and two, it was uh, fashionable. You know, and and I, I'll just give you examples to make it very concrete for you. We are in the business of, of diapers. You know. Um, you are too young, but maybe your parents, when you know they were babies, they had diapers which were like that thick. Today, it is like this. And not only does it bring more comfort, but it's actually increased performance, despite the fact that it's very thin. But what's very interesting is that because those materials are much more weight efficient, they use much less carbon. So if I take just the last five years, Pampers, our diaper brand, has been able to remove 1 million ton of CO2 from, from its supply chain just by having more weight efficient material. And you know, we were doing that decades ago. So we were doing that even before the concept of sustainability started. So sustainability, if we, to, if we look at our own operation, it's actually smart business because when you use less water, less energy, less material, you know, it goes straight to the bottom line. This is why our product supply organization has been doing sustainability for so long. Now, recently, the term has moved from, you know, this is what you do to uh, do less harm to this is what you do to do more good. And it's a business opportunity for your brand to uh, drive um, delight with consumers while reducing their footprint. And, and I'll be able to give many more examples, but. Um, the point I wanted to drive is that it started a long time ago with PNG. Um, at, at many levels, it is about doing smart business because it's using less of the resources. And now it's really moving into, it's a business opportunity that uh, our brands are embracing to deliver, we call it irresistible superiority that is sustainable. So you delight consumers and at the same time, you enable them to reduce their footprint. And I, I will give you a few examples as, as we go through the discussion. Yeah, that would be great because we do live in a, in a world that, you know, according to surveys and studies that we see, especially we account for issues for climate change, it seems that we are moving at speed, but we're moving at speed in the wrong direction, right? So we, we are collectively increasing our carbon emissions. And that's precisely why the two sides of the problem that you described, minimizing the harm, but at the same time, looking at the issue of sustainability as a growth opportunity, but a positive growth opportunity, right? As you said, that can, can, can actually uh, delight the customers while achieving this positive social impact is so important. So uh, I know that you often not only give these examples, but you also draw this very important link between sustainability and, and innovation and how that has helped you at PNG come up with these new products that, uh, or, or adjust the products that you discussed earlier. So I think it would be actually fantastic if you can walk us through a couple of those examples just to see how the two work together in practice. Yeah, you know, it's it's very interesting to see that. Uh, Virginie, for some reason, you were muted. I'm sorry, I'm not sure why that happened. I, yeah, didn't, do, I didn't do anything, so you have muted me. You didn't like my answer. No. <laughs> so, um, no, 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 you no. Know, <laughs> <laughs> I think, um, I, let me just step back a bit and, and explain, you know, my role and how does innovation fit into my role? I mean, you describe my mission as, um, you know, and trying to embed sustainability into how we build our brands, how we uh, develop our innovation. And actually there is a big element also uh, in how we build our culture. Uh, and I've been doing that for the past 10 years where I've been at this job uh, with, um, um, you know, fairly good success, especially in the past three years where we've seen an acceleration. I mean, just to give you an example on brands, you know, we are the company that invented brand management 100 years ago. And now we are reinventing brand management by including sustainability as an integral part of it. So uh, at PNG, we have a very um, uh, kind of systemic way to build our brands. And we are uh, basically reinventing that to make sure that our brand builders look at sustainability as a key input. So we have a framework that we call Brand 2030. We are asking our brands to deliver on a number of things, including 
setting their own North Star? What is your social or environmental North Star that goes beyond your functional benefit? Um, and that will be measurable and against which you will innovate and develop a pipeline of projects that will get us closer to the, your North Star. Concrete example, and we've announced it uh, a few months ago on our laundry business that's tied in the US, that's aerial in uh, Europe. We've committed, and that's their North Star, that um, they will reinvent what clean is about by decarbonizing laundry at every step. And when we say every step, we mean from the supply chain, the material we use in our product and packaging, all the way down to the use phase. And what we need to understand is that uh, for detergent, two thirds of the carbon footprint is actually linked to the temperature of the washing machine when people wash their clothes. And so you can imagine the type of innovation that will play there. So this is why for decades, we've innovated so that our products perform better in cold water. And just through this uh, effort that we've been doing, we've been able to um, increase the number of loads that are done globally in cold water from 38% in 2010 to 70% 10 years later because we give people the tools that um, uh, they are reassured to turn to cold water because they know that they will get great cleaning performance. And in the first place, they, they want to wash in cold because they know it's better for the longevity of their clothes, they know it's better for the fidelity of the colors, but they are afraid to do this because they believe that the stents will not survive. So when you come up with a technology that works better in cold water, you reassure them and you nudge them to actually now turn to cold. And so IEL has committed to reduce by five degrees by 2025, the average temperature in, in Western Europe, which is 40 degrees today. So five degrees down in five years. In the US, Tide has committed to increase the number of cold loads to 45% all the way up to 75% by 2030. So behind that, you have innovation first. But then it's not enough. You need the nudging because you develop a great product that works better in cold water, but you still need the consumer to turn the dial. Yeah? And for that, um, our two superpowers of PNG are innovation and consumer engagement. So we basically activated the two for this. And so on consumer engagement, we have a campaign in Europe that is called Every Degree Makes a Difference. It's, it's in partnership with National Geographic, and it really brings um, uh, consciousness with people that just one degree actually would make a difference. Actually, if you turn from 40 degrees to 30, you save 35% of energy. In the US, we have, you may have seen it, it's a campaign that is called Cold Colors, and it's with the rapper Ice-T. Uh, more recently, actually, Tide has partnered with NFL, and their objective wow. is to turn the 80 uh, million households of uh, NFL lovers to turn to coal, you know? So we leverage our scale, we leverage our consumer understanding, great creativity and innovation so that we actually have impact, you know, at the use phase. So that's an example on how, you know, innovation, brand building uh, uh, can come together to actually drive impact. I think that's a really brilliant framing in terms of, you know, innovation in a sense is what sort of you need to do in order to get the products uh, um, to, to decarbonize and so on. But you, you sounded, uh, Virginia, describing the fact that, you know, consumer behavior is an absolutely critical component right because uh, to work with your products with your innovation capability in order to reduce the, the overall impact of that particular product and and I know as you mentioned that you know Ariel has uh, your brand Ariel has a very uh, uh, ambitious net zero target by 2040 and correct me if I'm wrong you also have a the, the, this idea of a, a completely decarbonized laundry value change by 2030 even if, yes. if I'm not mistaken right which in a world in which we hear about 2050, uh, talking about 2040 or 30 is, is, is quite ambitious. Yes. So yes. Um, I want to explore those two uh, aspects because the innovation is, and, and, and consumer engagement are both words that are being thrown around quite a bit. So first of all, on the innovation uh, front, Virginie, so 
how do we make innovation happen? What are the biggest challenges in getting a, a, such a large organization like P&G to, to innovate? Because, you know, there's people that often associate, you know, large established companies with lack of innovation. And sustainability yes. poses yet another level of, of challenge in order to innovate. Yeah. So how do we make innovation happen? Yes. So, um, as I said, you know, innovation is really one of our superpower. I mean, we uh, have a, a, a large organization. We have a culture of innovation. And so what we are doing now is that we are kind of shifting all this power, all this competence and capability to make sure that sustainability is part of it. You know? and, and it's kind of a new lens. Uh, and actually, I was uh, speaking at an internal uh, summit that we have, which is called Winnovation yesterday. So Winnovation. I mean, that, that's really the way we look at it. Uh, we believe that uh, our business model is, is uh, predicated upon superior innovation, which allows to deliver greater value to consumers, you know, uh, come under higher price, which help us reinvest into innovation. So that's the virtual system. So um, how do we make it happen um, uh, within PNG? Well, we actually always, for, for um, talking about sustainability, we always start with science. So, um, you know, you have very different point of view of what needs to be done on sustainability. And so, because we have all those different point of view at PNG, the first thing we do is that we, we start with science and we start with a tool that is called the life cycle assessment. And that's actually a tool that PNG pioneered already 20 years ago. We are one of the first one. And it shows you the impact of your product across the product phases. So from raw material all the way down to disposal. And this is where I got the 60% of a detergent uh, footprint is in the use phase. You know? So because we want to make sure that what we do and where we innovate is where we can make the biggest difference. Yeah. So uh, it, it's a very important tool because it basically dictates our priority on innovation. So I talk detergents, priority is to innovate for greater performance in cold water, but I also mentioned our diaper business. We don't use diaper uh, with water in use. So on diapers, our biggest impact is actually the supply chain. This is why we started decades ago to reduce or to increase the efficiency of, of the weight of our material to innovate on, on material so that we can reduce the weight of a diaper, you know? So this is how we uh, define our priorities. And then how does it happen? We have brilliant scientists, you know, um, that innovate not just actually for our own product, but more and more for the entire industry, because there is something very important about sustainability is that we believe that there are a lot of things that we can do to benefit the industry, uh, it's it's called you know kind of co um, it's not cooperation it's competition you know it's it's kind of a collaboration with your own competitors because if you do that you kind of level the playing field and all boats rise and you win and and they win and that's really the the, the ultimate in sustainability. I just give you a, an example, a quick example. Um, we have invented a new way to turn recycled polypropylene into uh, a virgin state. Today, uh, polypropylene, so that's the plastic we use for our caps on our bottles, for instance. When you recycle it mechanically, uh, it turns into a gray color, which, and with some odor, which limits the, the potential application. So you don't have a full circular economy of, of the recycled polypropylene. With our invention, it turns into virgin state almost, so you can have many applications. So you actually create a much better circular economy. Well, this PNG invention, we actually license out to a company called Pure Cycle. So we open sourced it. And now, you know, plant is being uh, built that our competitors are using and the whole industry is using. So that's an example on how innovation benefit our own uh, product, but can actually also benefit the, the entire industry. Great. Um, I, I actually, it's great that you mentioned that example because I'm looking at one of the questions that just came in uh, exactly on that topic, which is basically asking, uh, Hannah is asking, have you, how have you been able to form partnerships, especially we talk about brands 
or industry collaborations that allow you in some ways to even set new industry standards or in fact actually learn across the different sectors so do you and by the way i should tell this to our audience our q a function is open i'm reading and, and i will be moderating the questions so please do keep them coming and we'll, we'll uh, uh i'll ask virginie to to address them as we go along so what are can you give us uh, some of those examples Absolutely. of partnerships and or so, even cross learnings yeah yes so first i would say we will not solve the sustainability challenges on our own no organization can solve them on their own so collaboration and partnership is part of uh, the solution it's actually a key part of the solution and so i'm going to give you an example and it's again on the circular economy you know the one of the um one of the great things about the new commitments from all companies is that you've seen um, all those pledges for 100% uh, recyclable packaging and also integrating what is called PCR, so post-consumer recycled material into your own packaging, which is great. This is how you start developing the circular economy. Now, the fact is that today, demand of this PCR outstrips supply. There is not enough with status production, there is not enough we can supply to the brands who want to integrate, especially for the high quality one, which most of us, we call it food grade, are using. So how do you unlock this barrier? One way is what I just mentioned. You know, when you use those um, advanced recycling technology, you can actually get much better quality recycled material. Another way is to look at where are the bottleneck across the value chain. One of the bottleneck on this is the sorting. Today at recyclers, there is not enough accuracy to sort you know, food grade versus non-food, to really sort the different stream of, of plastic in a way that allows to have a high quality recycled material. So five years ago with uh, Elaine MacArthur Foundation, um, one of our uh, uh, packaging scientists developed a project that is now known as Holy Grail 2.0. And Holy Grail is a technology that uses digital watermark. So imagine like stamp size uh, watermark embedded on the whole surface of a packaging, invisible to the human eye, but that can be scanned with a specific scanning material at the, recycle, at the recyclers. And that has a very high level of accuracy. And so we have built a coalition. Now it's 135 members across the value chain. So from the people who do the, the plastic, the people who use the plastic like us, the recyclers, the waste managers, you know, they're all on this coalition. Um, and last week there was the first semi-industrial test in the city of Copenhagen, uh, which is quite amazing because on top of uh, giving a benefit of much better sorting, which accelerate the circular economy. It also allows uh, to have a benefit for engaging with consumers. Imagine all those multiple QR code on the packaging. And so you can actually much more easily engage with people. So many uh, um, kind of collateral uh, advantages to this technology, but that's a very specific illustration on how we need to work with the supply chain, with the cross value chain sectors, you know, to be able to solve so, some of these challenges. Absolutely. And then from my knowledge, uh, from the circular economy, one of the barriers is exactly those the sorting technologies or the waste management technologies, and, and in many ways, the lack of infrastructure to do that, right? And as you said, uh, solutions that are so obviously beneficial for the entire industries, right, are still kind of in the process of kind of being, being developed and, and being applied. Yes, um, yes. So, Virginie, I, I want to explore almost sort of the mirror image of what you were just discussing, because you talked a lot about changes in product characteristics, changes in the product packaging, for instance, changes in product performance. If we talked about, you know, the, the, the uh, lowering the degrees on laundry and so on. Clearly, you're in company that I'm not sure there's any countries around the world in which you do not function. Right. So clearly you have this multi-country challenge where consumer preferences, cultures, 
right? Even usage of, of these appliances even might be different. Um, and, and, and I wanted to, to, to ask you, you know, as part of your broader engagement with the consumer, how do you handle the challenges that, uh, that, as, uh, that, that um, result from the fact that you do have this multi-country, multi-culture yeah. uh, uh, footprint? You know, that's very interesting because when you look at it from the angle of the consumers, we see very similar trends and needs and aspiration across country. You know, uh, if you look at the top three issues, um, you will see number one, packaging. So it gets different manifestation, whether you are in a country with actually very little waste management infrastructure, then the packaging issue is really about littering, you know, and, and, and packaging going to the ocean and plastic pollution. Um, where you are in a more developed country, it's about, you know, coming back from your grocery shopping and having a, a, a full bin of uh, excess uh, packaging that, that is really irritating, you know. But, but packaging and reducing the waste linked to um, the consumer goods package that we buy is usually number one. And then you have, depending on uh, where people are located, you have water and energy related uh, issues, you know. And um, so, so you need to, the way you, um, you handle those are, are uh, different de depending on the region. So on water, for instance, um, it's very local, uh, but when, when it happens, it's very serious. Um, Actually, I, I, I want to mention something. I'll go back to the collaboration because I think that's a great example. You know, you remember Cape Town three years ago, maybe they faced an amazing drought yeah. to the point that they were afraid to get to what they called day zero. Day zero is basically when there is no more water at the tap. And so in the end, um, they avoided this day zero because the government said restriction of water, 50 liters per person per day. Today, uh, the average consumption per person per day is about 150 liters in Europe, up to 500 liters in some parts of the US, right? 50 liters is not much. You know, when you take an eight minute shower, uh, it's 80 liters already, you know? So you have a lot of restriction with 50 liters. And actually when we send our people there to, to understand how consumers were living with 50 liters, they were horrified because for instance, you have women with long hair who had to cut the hair because you cannot wash and rinse long hair only with 50 liters. So they had to go through a number of, um, you know, coping mechanism and that was not a good life, you know? And this is where our people decided to innovate so that you could actually live well with only 50 liter per person per day, which we now know is probably the sustainable level of water consumption. And five years later, and actually COP26, we announced the co-chair of this coalition. We have a coalition which is called the 50 liter home coalition with people from Ikea to Arcadis, Suez, Electrolux or Kohler. So across the whole value chain, the objective is to innovate so that people, both on infrastructure and product, so that people can live well, even better, with 50 liter per person per day, you know? And, and in, in uh, Glasgow, we announced that the, the co-chair uh, will be uh, Kate Gallego, and Kate is the mayor of Phoenix, fifth mm -hmm. largest city in, in, uh, in the US and top five in terms of water scarcity, you know? So this is an example of how we deal with water. We go where there is a need, but then we create something that will actually change the system. And, and the 50 liter home, like the Holy Grail on digital watermark, are actually coalition that have the power to transform the system. Mm -hmm. So, you know, this is how we go about it. So it's not just fixing the issue so that we can actually, uh, uh, people can use our product more in that area. It's how do we change, you know, the, the entire system. and. Um, it would be the same thing on waste management. You know, waste management, as I said, uh, we do differently. We have partnership in the US, for instance, with the recycling partnership. Objective there is to increase the uh, percentage of collection and recycling, which is still too low. It's 30% uh, in the US, way too low. But if you go to Southeast Asia, the issue is completely different. It's about helping the government to actually build 
waste management infrastructure. And for that, you know, we have created the, uh, we are one of the founding member of the Alliance to End Plastic Waste, which invests in creating, you know, scalable pilot that has to do with creating the infrastructure. So, you know, you, you uh, operate very differently whether, depending on the region and where, what's the manifestation of the issue. But at the consumer level, you see that the top three issues are actually basically the same, whether you are in Los Angeles or whether you are in uh, Vietnam, you know? Mm -hmm. So that's, I, I want to follow up a, a little bit on that because you're, you're saying, well, there are some common themes here. And especially if you go, the, I think the, the, the uh, South Africa example that you mentioned is absolutely a, a fantastic one in the sense that it, it gives you kind of the necessity as the mother of innovation in, in, in many ways, right? Uh, and in, in, in a sense, well, we live in a whole planet that is facing that necessity or that scarcity, right? And that's precisely how that, that's translating into the, the economic system. So in that respect, Virginie, I want to draw on the second superpower that you mentioned earlier, which is this idea of brand management. Clearly, uh, you're one of the companies that have experienced consumer demands and expectations firsthand and perhaps how those have changed in recent years right especially given the uh, uh, the demands for a low carbon economy for uh, you know to, to uh, um, uh, reduce our, our dependence on resources and so on so can you describe to us in your experience yes. how what are the major trends uh, over time that you have seen in, in the recent yeah. years and how that manifests in terms of what PNG is doing absolutely so what we've seen in the recent years, and, and I would say that the pandemic has basically accelerated all of those trends. So it used to be that we have something we call the, uh, let's call eco-consumers. Those are the ones that when they make a purchase decision, sustainability is the top three, it's part of the top three. You know, like very consciously, they, they go and ask for, is this product um, sustainable? It used to be, more or less 10 to 15% across regions, you know? And it's, it's, it was staying that, at that level for many, many years. Um, today, and it's new in the past two, three years, it's at 20% and it's growing at an index of 125. In countries like Germany, it's already at 40%. And globally, we expect these segments to be 40% by 2025, you know? So, Clearly, we can say now that sustainability is and will increasingly be a key consideration for people when they purchase a, a, a product. Now, um, the, the other thing that we've seen is that now consumers are saying that they want to do something about it. You know, and this is broadly, it's not just those eco-consumers. Broadly speaking, we have 70, 73%, 73 of people saying, they want to reduce their environmental impact. And that's nine points up versus two years ago. This is a huge trend. Now, there is something with sustainability, which is we are seeing several gaps. The first gap, we call it the, the intention to action gap. So people tell you in survey, I want to reduce my footprint. Uh, actually, we have 92% of people telling us, I want to live a more sustainable life. Amazing. Now you dig deeper and you ask them, so what have you changed in your behavior? Only 16%, one six are saying I've changed something to reduce my footprint. So there is really this, and, and if I take the number one thing that people say, which is I want packaging with less material. So you have 43% of, uh, of people saying, I want a, a product that have the least amount of packaging. You know, only 29% have actually go and look for for packaging with less. So you have this tension there. Why? One, because it's complicated to know which choice is a better choice. It's very complicated. You know, if you are a scientist at PNG, you cannot get it, you know? But if you are a normal person, it's really complicated. So first reason. And then there is always this tension of whether will they trade off, will they have to trade off on, some, on something? Will they have to trade off on on performance, on price, will that be more expensive, you know? And people don't want generally, or on convenience, they don't want to trade off. So for that reason, we see that gap. It is an amazing opportunity for us as brands to help bridge that gap, you know? And to one, innovate so that you do what we call make sustainability irresistible, 
you design it in a way that is so amazing that even if they are not interested in sustainability, they want that. You know, so you make sustainability irresistible. And the second thing that we do is that you nudge them. You nudge them with the right tools at the right moment. You know, and I talked about nudging already on um, uh, on uh, laundry. But let me give you another example, which I, is probably my favorite. Mm -hmm. Dishwashing. Your dishwashing is the second most hated household chore. After after what you can guess. After what if that's the second one? The first one is cleaning your toilet, right? So, but right after you have doing your dishes. Okay. Now, um, this is why dishwashers were invented, you know, because they yeah. save you time uh, and, and it's a great thing. Now in the US, the rate of dishwasher is very high. Basically everyone has a dishwasher, but the percentage of usage is actually pretty low. And you know why? Because people believe that dishwashers actually use more and waste more energy and water than doing it by hand which is actually wrong because a running sink uses four gallons of water every two minutes and four gallons is what is used in an entire cycle of dishwasher. So you do the math, as of eight items, you actually save water and energy when you run your dishwasher versus doing it by hand. Now, the big caveat is that you need to make sure that you have a detergent product good enough so that you don't pre-rinse your dishes before putting them in the dishwasher, which is what many people do. And this is why our dish brand, which is called Cascade in the US, has developed a formulation that allows you to skip the sink. So you put directly in your dishwasher and you can actually uh, save money. And we have an amazing campaign. If you haven't seen it, go watch it. It's uh, with uh, um, Sarah Geller and uh, Freddie uh, Prince, right? Famous glamorous couple in the US. And uh, they basically talk about doing it every night. It's obviously a kind of a tongue in cheek type of uh, uh, communication, but it's really effective. And with that, you know, we've seen a habit actually totally being transformed. We have a plus 25% of usage on dishwasher, and that's equivalent to saving across the US 25 billion gallons of water. You know, you can imagine. So this is really where, where you combine PNG innovation power, PNG engagement skill with consumers and making sure that we work on the biggest impact areas like the water usage for dishwasher. This is what you can get. This is the type of effect that you can get. Fantastic. And, and I, I like this idea of, 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 of uh, how you frame everything, uh, Virginia, as a partnership with all these different stakeholders and PNG uh, in order to get to the eventual uh, outcome. And there's a, a number of questions that came in that, of course, pertain to this idea that, you know, you do deal with, with different customers across different regions. But of course, as you mentioned, there are these common trends. I want to ex expand that a little bit to other stakeholders, because clearly, and we talked about infrastructure before, right clearly these will depend on government as well this is going to depend on sometimes perhaps the local civil society or ngos that you work or partner with and of course different aspects of the supply chain that you have to work with so you can you talk to us a little bit about how those elements in other words government regulation civil society uh ngos and, and the supply chain feed into that equation yeah, I mean, all of the above are absolutely necessary to do what I believe is the ultimate, which is to transform the system. And if I just go back to my two examples, I mean, holy grail, you absolutely need the local management. I mean, actually, we did a test in the city of Copenhagen, you know, you need the city and cities have an amazing role there, you know, because they they are the one who can make things happen, you know, on the, on the ground uh, for waste management, for water management. And so, you know, you need absolutely the local, um, the local management. Um, you absolutely need um, the, the NGO and, and uh, organization like, you know, WWF, WRI, you know, for, for water, because they actually help you, they, they kind of push, they, they do two things. I mean, if you take WWF, which is, they are our strategic partner. You know, we developed with them our goals on natural climate solution, on, on our water goals. 
And so they obviously provide the, the, the science of nature that we don't uh, necessarily have in house. Um, and they also help uh, keep us honest. That they really help us, you know, uh, make sure that um, that we follow the highest standards. So they are absolutely critical. And you know, I have created internally um, an advisory board. It's it's an external advisory board, and um, we have five advisors. You know, they come to Cincinnati. Uh, used to we have done three virtually now, but um, for one day uh, to talk to the C-suite. It, it is chaired by the CEO. And basically you have uh, people from WWF, from Conservation International, you have young activists, you know, you have practitioners as well, people from our supply chain. So you, you, that, those are the people you need around the table. You know? And um, I think we are even going uh, further now. I mean, the, um, the concept of kind of radical um, collaboration from industry to activists. Uh, a few years ago, I was part of an amazing experience uh, we went um, on, a, uh, on a leadership um, uh, kind of ship uh, um, journey where the idea was to go to the um, Atlantic gyre, you know, these uh, patches of plastic uh, in, the, in the ocean that comes from, um, uh, you know, the, the plastic that gets, that leaks into the, uh, into the ocean. And so we were 163 stakeholders on this ship, from um, you know PNG, Nestle, and others, all the way to Greenpeace. And we were working and actually diving because there, there, there was some diving into the plastic together, because we realized that we had the same agenda in terms of trying to find a solution to the huge problem of ocean plastic pollution in that case. And so we were having kind of breakouts and, and workshop on the ship, then you know, going and understanding the, the issue in the sea itself. Uh, that was quite amazing. And actually now this, uh, this experiment is becoming a network, an official network of industry to activists because we need each other you know, to really, I mean, shake the system and be able to build it again you know, as, as a positive impact system. Mm -hmm. Experiential learning can be extremely powerful, especially when you, I think when you bring people face to face with these negative impacts, right? In the same way that I personally think that uh, activism is so important because it brings us, our generation, face to face with the generation that's going to suffer most from yep. what we are doing today. So, you know, these future generations that we often talk about, they're not kind of these unborn sort of generations, they're here and they're the teenagers yeah. of today, right? And those are the ones that are going to suffer uh, from our choices or, you know, at, the, at least our choices are going to affect how their quality of life. Um, Virginie, since you did bring about uh, many times this idea of systems level change, right and, uh, and and of course we are in the second week of cop 26 and people have hopes and expectations on, on how governments and, and other stakeholders but how governments can come together and and at least begin to change that system right or at least make some changes to that system so from your point of view and given uh, you know what what's happening at cop 26 uh, what are your hopes and what are your expectations about what might be achieved uh, by the end of the week. And uh, I'm yes. deliberately distinguishing between hopes and expectations because yes. in this context, there might be two different things. So what's, yeah. what, what's your views? You, you know, I think that the most important for me in COP was the, the run-up to, uh, to COP26. Um, I don't know if you realize, but I mean, there were big commitments made on the run-up. And, and today, I think it's about 89% of the global emissions that are captured by some kind of net zero pledge. I mean, it's not bad, you know? And, and uh, we actually made our own uh, net zero commitment ahead of COP26. So there is something into this momentum that builds to COP26. Now, the, the fact that Russia and, and, the, uh, and China were not at the table, actually it's not too uh, good of a, a news, but I think now the, the key things will be after. It's going to be about the implementation and what was uh, uh, talked at, at, um, at La in Glasgow. So like a question like, you know, will the promises obviously be kept? Will, will the money flow? Will uh, the inflation uh, create a backlash, you know, to, uh, to what's needed for the energy transition? So 
all these questions are obviously um, are very fair. And so it, it's really well judged. Uh, and, and also that, you know, there will be both economical and, and um, uh, uh, political uh, consideration, obviously, in the implementation. But so I think the intention are there. I think we now need to see on the ground what's happening. But I'm sure of one thing is that as PNG, you know, we will stay the course. I mean, we have a net zero commitment. We have, uh, uh, we need all the, the, the hands on deck, actually, not just ours, but we need everybody's hands on deck, including our competitors, which I think is what is the most exciting. I would say, what I think is the most exciting to me, it's not really the pledges, you know, because it's kind of easy to make pledges. It's the new level of collaboration that we are seeing. Uh, and, and as I said, you know, from a very wide range, industry to activist, uh, government and business together, all those amazing initiatives I mentioned, Holy Grail, the 50 Little Home Coalition, this is the only way out. And I think people are convinced that we need to, to go there. And I think those are the new skills that we will need in the future with the new leaders. I mean, those, how do you collaborate well? I was raised uh, in, a, in a context of the only thing that we were learning was how do you compete well? I mean, this is still super important because this is how you create value you know, for your company, for your uh, stakeholders. But how do you collaborate well? I think it's the new name of the game. And, um, and what I'm seeing gives me hope, you know, because those are really, those are very concrete things. I mean, the only way you can worry about is what you have a chance to control. And that's my philosophy. And, and that's why I'm excited about this new program that are really about changing and transforming the system. Mm -hmm. I'll pick up a very, very important thing that you said. Uh, I mean, you said many important things, but I mean, in this, this answer, you said no matter what happens at COP, um, PNG will stay the course, right? And the net zero commitment to 2050. Um, and clearly, in this COP, we, we hear a lot about very important important issues that are being discussed, the whole idea about carbon pricing, the whole idea of carbon tax and whether Europe is going to go ahead with a border adjustment uh, tax on carbon. And of course, a big, big question mark about will we ever have a global market for carbon offsets that is you know, robust enough to help us? Uh, so even, and I'm pretty sure there's many other policies that are being discussed. So um, we, we're taking as a given that PNG is staying the course. I guess my question is, what could help you accelerate from the governmental and policy point of view? Clearly, collaboration can help, uh, um, you know, uh, pool resources. But from a kind of a regulatory institutional point yeah. of view, what, well, well, what could accelerate your efforts? Yes, I mean, yeah. you mentioned it, and it's a concrete example for me, is that we are proponent of pricing carbon. You know, the, to, to, to basically level the playing field, you know, uh, to accelerate the climate transition. Uh, in the US, for instance, PNG has been very vocal um, to advocate uh, what the Climate Leadership Council is, uh, has proposed. You know, it's a, it's a bipartisan proposal, it's a carbon tax and dividend policy, um, and it taxes carbon. But that, what I think is super smart is that it refunds all the money to the people. And it's about $2,000 a year per family. And I think this is uh, the absolute perfect you know, policy because it is what we call a just energy transition, you know, just as, as in FAIR. And being French, you know, I know what happens when you design climate policy uh, with other people, especially the most vulnerable ones. I mean, it's called the yellow uh, jacket movement. I was there. Uh, it's very painful. And it's, it's what happens when, you know, you don't, uh, you leave people behind, basically, as you do the, your, your climate transition. So I'm a, a, to, back to your question, I think we should have those carbon uh, uh, tax policy, um, leverage the free market you know, in a way that, that, that makes sense and gives back to the people. Um, uh, I'm also a proponent on uh, you know, making sure that we level the playing field in terms of uh, managing uh, what we call extended uh, producer responsibility, that we... Um, it's called the polluter pays, but it's like, you know, you, you share the cost across the value chain to make sure that you develop this circular economy. So everything that level the playing field so that, you know, a company like us can actually then innovate and create more value uh, for consumers and, and for all stakeholders, we are a big proponent of it. Fantastic. Uh, Virginia, I'm very co cognizant of the time, and I'm sorry to see that we only have 
10 minutes remaining and we have a couple of questions. I want to slightly switch gears a little bit here because you so passionately and vividly talked about so many sustainability issues and it's clear how, you know, real personal uh, passion of yours sustainability is. So I, I want to ask a, um, a, a, a bit of a personal question, which is, um, you know, where is this coming from? What were the pivotal moments in your career that make you so passionate about the topic of sustainability? And given that we have uh, amongst our audience, we also have, uh, you know, our students that are thinking about, very seriously thinking about careers in this space, right? What would be your top tips in terms of skills and capabilities that a leader, a business leader will require in, in a world in which sustainability is becoming so important? Sure. So on your first question, I may disappoint you, Yonis, but um, what got me into this is pure business. You know, it's um, basically the fact that I was leading our detergent business. That's why I'm talking a lot about detergent because that, that, well, that's my uh, origin myth, basically. It's, it's, you know, the detergent business. It was 15 years ago. I was in Europe. The business was not doing well at all, not doing well at all. Share was down. I have to find ideas to revitalize the business. And so I tested many ideas. And the one that popped to the top was Ariel cleans so well, you can wash your clothes in cold water. It was a business idea and people loved it because they said, I want to do it, but I don't have the performance. Well, now you have it. And so, and we even said, so if you do that, you will see saving on your electricity bill because you know you wash in cold water. It was one of the best commercial innovation. Now, a year later of that, we are in 2004, 2005, Al Gore comes out with the inconvenient truth, which uh, was for me a watershed uh, moment. I took my team to watch. It's the first time I heard about global warming, you know? But at the same time, I also discovered, and I talked about it, the concept of life cycle assessment. And I learned there that for laundry detergent, the biggest part is actually, the biggest part of the footprint is the temperature of the washing machine. So I kind of said, wait a minute, what just happened? I, I was able to grow my business in one of the most significant way. And at the same time, reduce the footprint of my brand in one of the most significant way, you know? And this is where it clicked for me. And I said, this thing about sustainability is actually quite amazing. So long story short, I educated myself. I went to this training, which is called One Planet's Leader, which was my, my mm -hmm. second pivotal moment, WWF and, and IMD in, in Switzerland. And at the end of this training, I said, look, I said that, you know, when you do your learning and, and take away from the training, I said, I am going to make sustainability my job. At the time, it was still kind of a hobby on the side. I had no idea what that meant. But two weeks after that moment, I'm flying to Cincinnati. I asked to meet the CEO and I said, look, I think we have an opportunity here. We need to be able to bridge the science of sustainability because we had a lot of scientists and toxicologists, you know, working the science, but they were totally disconnected from the business. So I said, we need to bridge business and science. And by the way, I want that job. And he said, okay. And so we had created the first, it was a marketing director sustainability role which then grew into the uh, 10 years later, the chief sustainability officer role. But you know, it started from actually growing the business and decreasing your footprint can go together. This is why we call now force for good and force for growth. So, and then, you know, once you are in, there is no way back. It's so fascinating as a topic. It's an integrating strategy that integrates brand innovation culture. So, so that there is no better job on earth. So that's, yeah. that's my pitch for the, for the role. So, so, um, <laughs> so sustainability is irresistible from that respect as well. Irresistible. <laughs> now, in terms of, you know, it's, it's interesting because I get so many people come internally and externally say, I want to work on sustainability. You know, what should I do? And I said, well, I have good news and bad news for you. The good news is you can absolutely work on sustainability. The bad news is you stay where you are. You know, there is not like such a place of going work on sustainability. You need to be the best lawyer if you are a lawyer and then integrate sustainability, the best finance people, person, and then do sustainability as part of it, the best marketers and integrate sustainability. So my advice is be the best at what you do. 
and then integrate sustainability as part of it. You know, that, that's for me the, you know, we call it kind of the T knowledge thing. You know, you are great at what you do, plus you integrate this new, this new skill. And there is a little bit of science, but most of it you can learn as you do it, you know, really. So excellence is what you do, and then you integrate sustainability. That would be my advice. Wonderful. Thank you. I, uh, I also went through the questions and I realized that uh, uh, we have answered already a number of them. If you allow me, I, I want to pose one that is um, relevant to what we were talking about earlier. I'm sorry for jumping to topics, but I, I wanted to make sure that we get to all the questions. Clearly, as a, one big issue that we are discussing at, uh, uh, that's being discussed at COP26 is, of course, the huge gap between the global north and the global south and the fact that um, the $100 billion a year commitment to, to finance the transition in developing countries hasn't materialized. And now we're talking about 2023 as maybe will materialize. So Virginie, though, um, the FCMG uh, industry and companies like Procter & Gamble in particular, they, you're already there, right? You see that gap on the ground, right? You see that the need to, the, the bigger need perhaps for more infrastructure in developing countries. So in that respect, what do you think is the, what could you do? What could business do? What could your industry do uh, while we're waiting for the government yeah. to, to do the financing? What can we do to close that gap yeah. between uh, developing Absolutely. And, developing and it's interesting because when you are a global company, you don't really look at it from, you know, the global north and the global south because you operate as businesses, you know, across. But you do understand uh, the difference. I talk about water and I talk about waste, which are probably the, the, the biggest two two biggest challenges where you have very different manifestation, whether you are in North and South. I would not say what can you do if, you know, until governments get their heart together. I will say you need to work together. I mean, back to the, uh, you know, the concept of collaboration. And, and I think as an example, the Alliance to End Plastic Waste uh, is for me a, a great set, a great construct because it's, um, it gets together, you know, the, the big players that have something to do with plastic. So from the one who make plastic, the one who use plastic like the brand, and the one who manage the, the end of life of plastic. So you really, I mean, we have 45 uh, company, big companies, you know, operating there. And then you work in the South, you work where the need is, you work where the waste management uh, infrastructure are needed. You work with the cities, the local government, because there is no one size fits all. You need to work with them to help them manage their waste, to build scalable pilots. Because what's very interesting is that, and somebody was saying that, you know, from, from Glasgow, there has never been so much money flowing and it wants to flow to those projects. The problem is that there is not enough scalable project to invest in. So what the Alliance to Plastic Waste is doing, it's catal catalytic capital. You know, you, you develop basically, and we've put $1.5 billion into that, to develop those scalable pilots. And then the big institutional money can, can flow to that. But there is a lot of work that needs to be done locally underground with local government to develop those pilots that then you can scale. Mm -hmm. Fantastic, and and uh, um, I, I'm, I'm, you, you did you did highlight this role of collaboration quite a bit, uh, Virginia, and, and I always uh, I, I like the the idea, and you know people don't even realize, given the demands that place on business, that this is a collective problem. This is a global society problem, and even if, or as you said, everyone does their best. Sadly, our, even if everyone does their best, our chances are still slim at this point, right? If we, if we, if we listen to the science. So given that Procter & Gamble, as you just described it, Virginia, and uh, that would be also my closing question, that it, this is a journey. It's not, it's not an overnight kind of a, achievement. This is a journey. So if you were to gaze into the future and, and what's ahead for uh, Procter & Gamble when it comes to sustainability, what's top of, your, of mind for you? What are the biggest issues that you would like to see uh, the uh, PNG addressing head on and making yep. progress in, in the next five to 10 so, years? You know, we are a consumer good company and we touch 5 billion people with our brands every day, you know? So, and our, and our impact is mostly when people use our product. So uh, faithful to my concept of let's focus on where you can make the greatest difference. This is where I can make the greatest difference is enabling people to live the sustainable life that they want to live. 
So in the future, I would see, you know, all PNG products, you know, uh, being uh, water positive, being carbon positive, having uh, the minimal amount of packaging or actually no packaging. This is uh, a shampoo. This is a, a, it's called functional fiber. It activates when you use it with water, no packaging. This is the product, you know. So that is actually the future. So how, you know, with innovation, you can enable people, those 92% of people who say they want to live a more sustainable life. You can actually enable that through, through your product. I will focus on innovation. I will focus on in use phase, programs like 50 liter home that, you know, not only reduce the amount of resources, but actually improve the quality of life for everyone on the planet. Amazing. And um, as I said, even at the beginning of this, uh, of this fireside chat, we can talk for hours, uh, given your experience and what you're doing about uh, at, at PNG and what PNG is doing in the sustainability space. But Virginia, on behalf of everyone and uh, uh, on this uh, uh, webinar that is watching and also on behalf of the Miami Herbert Business School, it's been an absolute uh, pleasure and a privilege. Thank you so much for, for so generously giving us one hour of your very, very valuable time to share with us your insights. Um, thank you once again. And uh, we look forward to a one day, perhaps soon, also welcoming you in person uh, at, uh, at the business. I would love that. Thank you so much. Thank you, much, Thank you my pleasure. Thank you. Have a great one. Thank you. And thank you, everyone, for joining.